Michael, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, in the case of Bumi, what, what you read in the papers is probably uh, all true, and you haven't heard half of it. So, uh, But I will, I will try to give you a, a balanced um, overview of, of, of the company, because underlying all of the founder shareholder issues, which, um, which I'm sure you've read about, um, which was really emanates from a fundamentally flawed structure when, when, this, uh, when the SPAC was set up, um, is, is some, are some very high quality underlying assets. Um, so uh, where are we? Um, you've, as I say, you've probably heard uh, everything about Boomi for the wrong reasons, shelled of infighting EGMs, financial irregularities, which we discovered earlier this year, uh, suspension of the listing, uh, you know, internecine oligarch warfare, etc. But un un underlying all this is, is a great asset base. Um, and so starting with our vision, uh, which is to become a leading UK listed thermal coal company with a focus on, on Asia, which is where our key growth markets are. What are our key strengths? Um, we have a strong rec track record of growth. Our subsidiary, Barao, which I'm going to focus on today, has, uh, has grown at a compound annual growth rate of almost 13% to, to over 20 million tonnes, uh, growing to 23 million tonnes this year. From a starting point uh, of about 5 million tonnes, um, and only, um, and only uh, roughly 12 years ago. It's had multiple owners, uh, and I would say over those years it's been undermanaged, um, and that's certainly one of, one of the... Um, the key focus areas that, that I, uh, I have, uh, have, have um, uh, focused on this year. Uh, we have an, a very advantageous transport position, very close to, obviously, our key customers in Asia. We also have a, a, a pretty inefficient capital structure, and that gives us further opportunities to, uh, to significantly add value here. So uh, I took over uh, late last year as the, as the CEO, um, and essentially... We had, um, in terms of the management of this company, two key assets, uh, well, th three, in, if, if you include the, the PLC as well. Uh, and all of them were run or managed by uh, related parties, either to the original uh, Bakri family uh, or, or Roseanne Roslani, who, uh, who was the um, uh, recent owner of, of Barao and was also the, the, the CEO of, of uh, Barao uh, through last year. Um, and so what followed was a, a major restructuring of uh, the board. Uh, we essentially removed all of the original uh, founder shareholders in terms of being directors of the company. And, uh, one of, and, and, and for the first time, uh, an independent CEO, which of course was myself, took over uh, late last year, at, at the PLC level. One of the first things we did was to put in independent management at, uh, at our subsidiary, Barao. We appointed Eka Burianto uh, to replace Roseanne. Um, and I could move quickly to remove any uh, links to the, the previous regime. Uh, so we, we, we said goodbye to a lot of people. We, uh, we put in a new organizational structure. Um, and uh, we moved out of the Recapital building in Jakarta uh, which was uh, which was Roseanne's uh, previous uh, headquarters, and that was important and, and not necessarily easy. And I think you know one of the things I would underscore is is working in a place like Indonesia, uh, particularly when you when you when you're dealing with um, you know significant uh, uh, founder shareholders like uh, the Bakris or or, the Ros or Ros Roseanne Roslani. It, it's not it's not as simple as operating in in, in some other emerging markets. Uh, so things like moving head offices out uh, are seen as, as uh, you know, as, as uh, quite uh, ag aggressive moves. Uh, and, and again, as many of you who are familiar with Asia will know, uh, sa you know this, this notion of saving face is, is, is ranks very high on their, on their priorities. So that was not easy in terms of moving old management, putting in new management, finding new locations for offices and so on. Um, it emerged as, as we went through a root and branch uh, exercise of, of, of our, our assets uh, and our subsidiary at Barao that we, we, we uncovered uh, significant financial irregularities. And I instituted a major FRP exercise, which is a financial reporting procedures exercise. Um, and uh, we uncovered uh, 
financial irregularities uh, in, in excess of $200 million. We've subsequently signed an agreement with the previous management to retrieve the majority of those funds. That hasn't happened yet, but uh, uh, we have some months uh, for that to, to work through. And I can touch on that later. Uh, and key was really to put in new systems and, and controls. And uh, we have achieved that today. I can't say that um, you know, we, we've removed, or we have every single key individual in the right position, but we've certainly made a, a number of major, major changes, and, and as I say, putting in the right systems and controls in place to ensure that what happened last year doesn't happen again. And I'm pretty confident that we have those systems in place today. We've also significantly tightened uh, payment approvals. We've ratcheted right down, as you can see in the bullet there, to anything above a million dollars. Uh, and this is on a, on a business that has a cost base of, of just over $1.1 billion. Anything above that comes to the PLC, either at Exco approval or my approval, or if it's higher than a certain amount, back to, uh, back to the PLC board. Uh, to, again, ensure that, that what we discovered last year doesn't happen again. Uh, likewise, we've had done an extensive review of all of the significant contracts we have across the group, and that's involved not just sending off letters to, to, to the various uh, contracts, uh, contractors that we have uh, around the group, but also required them to proactively send us back confirmations that there is no other arrangement in place uh, in terms of any procurement or uh, any of the, the, the contractors that, that mine some of our operations. And that's not easy, easy to, to achieve in Indonesia where you don't have a, a, a Royal Mail uh, system that, that works with overnight post. Uh, as, as you probably know, it's a, it's a huge archipelago. And, um, and, and so to get that in place as well uh, was, was a significant challenge. Key is, uh, is of course, uh, you know, in any business is to, is to have uh, uh, excellent management and we certainly did not have that. And so, you know, one of the first things I did was to, to look for um, a, a good CFO. We've, we've recently appointed uh, Paul Fenby as CFO, XBG and, and Petrofac. And I was looking for a CFO who, who was not going to sit in London and do the consolidation, but a CFO who was going to sit in Jakarta uh, to really roll up his sleeves and to implement all of these initial controls and systems that we've put in place. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, we've appointed a, a, a chief mining officer, Keith Downham, who's an ex, um, ex Peabody and uh, uh, Anglo American and, and BHP uh, chief operating officer, and and he he too has started with us and is based uh, in in Jakarta and increasingly at the mine. So we 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 are beginning to build a a, a first rate management team, I believe on the ground where the, where the operations are. In terms of London, I mean, I, I very much believe that uh, in, in the devolved, uh, devolved operating model, um, I mean, I learned quite a lot when, when, we, when I was at Anglo American, defended against Extrata, and we saw what, um, what, what's, what really, you know, tiny infrastructure Extrata had in place in London, uh, which essentially is, is, is really around the consolidation, the strategy, Internal audit um, and and and, um, and and general counsel legal. Um, the last bullet really, I think, uh, speaks for itself. As I said at the outset, we've removed all of the founder shareholders. None of them are on the board. None of them interfere at operating level. Uh, certainly not in our subsidiary Barao. And I think that's no mean achievement. And I'd argue in many respects that when people talk about separation from the backeries, separation has actually already occurred. Although, of course, they remain shareholders in the PLC, uh, but, but not directors. Uh, and we're working on a transaction to, to see whether we can uh, also affect the removal of, of the backeries as, as shareholders, which they, by the way, also want to uh, have happen. Um, one of the first things at the outset um, I, I, I did was a, uh, undertook was a benchmarking study. Um, and this is really uh, to, you know, ultimately... Uh, identify where we sit on, on, on the on the cost curve, um, because as as many of you know, in the mining business, uh, you're a price taker, and so it's all about uh, your cost base and about driving down costs. I identified an individual, an ex McKinsey consultant, who had done extensive work in the coal industry in Asia, uh, somebody called Jeremy Carter, who I have high respect for, and and he helped me very early on uh, with this initial benchmarking study. Uh, and really, I asked him to give us a no-holds-barred view of establishing the fact base, uh, where do we sit in the cost curve on a like-for-like -like basis, and what does it take to get to best-in-class uh, 
if, if we weren't there, which we certainly weren't. In parallel with this exercise, I also asked the question at the outset, and this is last January, uh, to achieve a 15% return on equity for our shareholders. What is the actual cost base that we need to get at current, at current uh, coal prices to achieve such a return? Because actually, ultimately, that's, that's, you know, that is, is what this is all about, is, is making money for our shareholders. And I always say to our operating managers in Indonesia, we don't mind coal, we mind money. Um, and the back calculation, if you, if you work back from that, was uh, resulted in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an equation that, that basically said we had to cut our operating costs by circa 30%, which is clearly uh, a, quite a challenge. So um, we have started with um, uh, six key breakthrough initiatives, which are, which are listed on the slide there. A lot of this is basically what I would call good, good housekeeping, uh, more than anything else. But uh, you know, over and above that, we also need to look at some further s fundamental structural cost changes, which I can touch on a little bit later. But essentially, it's looking at ras rationalization of, of our contractors and a reduction in rates. We need to look at a revised mine plan in this coal environment, which is very, very challenging, to see whether we can continue to reduce stripping ratios. Uh, fuel is a, is a big area of, 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 uh, of expense for us. We, we spend just over $250 million a year on fuel. Uh, these are all truck and shovel operations. So we're looking at uh, some new technology like adding, uh, like additives, uh, which, uh, which improves combustion. We've already achieved a 4% saving through that initiative, and we're looking at others. Um, we're looking at, uh, on exploration, at maximizing our utilization of our drilling equipment uh, through a shift, le uh, reduced shifts and, 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 and less rigs. We barge a lot. We're looking at increased uh, or, 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 or uh, larger capacity barges, and, and we're, we're doing some work there. And then a, reduce, a reduction in, in, our, in our marketing costs. And this is really uh, through, uh, the, we, we sell majority, in fact, all of our coal except Indonesian domestic production through, through, um, and through Noble. And we are looking to reduce uh, further uh, our, our costs there. Our capital structure, as I said at the outset, is pretty inefficient. Um, we've got uh, two bonds um, at 12.5% uh, and 7.25%, respectively. Um, and worse, we have about $250 million trapped in, a, in what's called a karma, which, a ca which is a cash and management account. Uh, so in fact, the real interest rate is, is, is probably even higher than what you, what you see here, because that, that, that that money in karma doesn't earn any interest for us. So we're looking at uh, post-separation refinancing at least one of those bonds, the higher, the higher of those, the 12.5%. And on a, on a net debt basis uh, today, we're at about $389 million. Um, and and, and um, hopefully uh, seek to reduce that if, uh, if we can through uh, the separation uh, from uh, from Bakri's and the sale of the PT Boomi stake, which would result in further inflow of cash to the PLC. Uh, turning briefly to, uh, to our, our 2013 half-year performance, uh, we're on track this year to produce, as I said earlier, to, uh, to, to, to attain the level of 23 million tonne production of thermal coal. Uh, we're exactly halfway through as, a, as a, the half-year. Uh, you can see from, uh, from, from the production cost of sales, which declined by 10%, we are making some progress there. That's mainly through lower stripping ratios uh, and, and, and reduced overburden distances. Um, and, you know, I always say this is, this is not a coal business. This is actually a, an earth-moving business. So for every one ton of coal, uh, at current strip ratios, we're moving at about, uh, about nine, just under nine bank cubic meters. And remember, the bank cubic meter is heavier than coal. Uh, so it's a significant amount of tonnage that we, we move uh, to produce one ton of coal. Um, our underlying EBITDA in the first half was uh, $80 million. That's, of course, in, in very depressed coal markets. Uh, to put it in, in context in, 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 in slightly better markets, uh, in 2011, our EBITDA was $511 million uh, for the full year. Turning to Barao, very briefly, because I know we, we don't have much time, as one of the major Indonesian coal producers, this map really sets out the, uh, the growing role Indonesia plays as, as, a, as a key player in the seaborne coal market. Uh, the seaborne coal market, for those of you who are not familiar, is, accounts for about just under 800 million tons a year. And Indonesia accounts for about 315 
uh, million tons of that. So it's about a 35% share. The bubbles in blue uh, represent the producers. You can see Indonesia, Australia, South Africa, Colombia being the key ones. Uh, and, and the red being the, 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 the consumers. And China, of course, being a, a significant consumer of, of around 4 billion tons and a, and a small net importer of about 137 million tons. Our operations on this map, uh, you can see where we're located, uh, on, the, on the northeast Kalimantan, uh, in, in a town called Tanjung, which is about a two-hour flight from uh, Jakarta. This is a, a, a map of where our operations are located. Um, it, uh, it, it may be a bit difficult for you to see, but essentially there are, there are three sort of key operations, key operating mines. On, on the northeast uh, there is Lati, which is the biggest. Uh, that's uh, produced uh, last year just, over, just under 11 million tons. Uh, then Sambarata to the left of that, west of that, uh, which produced just under 5 million tons. And then Binogan in the south, which is the third operation, uh, which produced uh, five and a half million tons. Uh, and that's really the biggest source of future growth for us. Uh, so total production uh, last year of, of um, just over 20 million tons, and as I say, going to, to 23 uh, million tons this year. It's a truck and shovel operation. Uh, so, you know, we use mainly 150 ton trucks. Uh, they, they're not the biggest, and we're looking at seeking to, to see whether we can use the bigger, potentially even sort of two, 320 ton trucks. Those are the very largest, and we use 30-ton coal hauling trucks. Essentially, uh, you know, it's it's uh, as it says, it's um, it's it's hauling uh, overburden and then and then hauling the coal, which is crushed at or near our three ports, uh, which are outlined on the map there. Uh, each of these ports has um, has has uh, you know uh, crushers, uh, uh, with the exception of Lati, which has four. The other ports have have two crushes of around 750 tons per hour. Uh, we then barge it down, uh, down the rivers uh, that you see there. Uh, we use typically 300-foot barges. Again, we're looking, uh, going back to the asset optimization initiatives, we're looking at increasing the size of those barges to 340-ton uh, barges, which 340-foot um, barges, which, which have a capacity of around 10,000 tons. And then it's transshipped um, with those barges, on those barges, to one of six transshipment vessels, which you, you can see there, that is the big black ship there. And they lie circa uh, 40 nautical miles out to sea because the coastline isn't deep enough for, uh, for the Panamaxis to come in. And then really lastly, a, um, just a, a, a brief overview of, of, of the um, thermal coal markets. Um, I think I, I won't dwell on this slide. I mean, I think it's, it's uh, you know, clearly coal still, produce, still plays a, a significant role in energy markets today. It accounts for 41% of the world's electricity, and more particularly in, in, in China and India, it's, it's more like uh, close to 70%. And those are our key markets where, where certainly in respect of China, Taiwan, and, and Hong Kong, we, we, we export uh, just about 60% of our, of our thermal coal. And, uh, and you can see here, these charts show where China is today and where India is today in 2012 and the projections into uh, 2025. And you can see that um, uh, they certainly, coal looks to maintain uh, its share at around two-thirds two uh, share for both countries in into, into the next uh, 10 years or so. Slightly reduced for China with, uh, with, with China uh, looking at, at, at greater nuclear demand. If you look back at the indu industrialization in the U.S. in the 50s, in the 40s and 50s, or 50s and 60s, uh, very similar parallel uh, trend for, for, for coal. Um, it, it maintained its, its, share, its share as the, um, as the U.S. Uh, continued to, to industrialize. Um, on, on coal markets more generally, uh, clearly we are in, in a weak uh, coal price environment. Uh, particularly over the last three or four years, uh, where, we, where we're seeing uh, a Newcastle benchmark price today of about $80 a ton. Uh, we, uh, we haven't seen significant uh, capacity coming out, um, and that's partly because of weaker producer currencies. But also take-or-pay contracts, particularly in Australia, uh, haven't helped and have created some, some uh, short-term oversupply. Uh, and as a result of that price, today we estimate around one-third of thermal coal, uh, of seaborne thermal coal production, is, is currently 
cash negative. So uh, you know something has to give either the price or you're simply going to see uh, further production being taken out. Uh, we do believe new capacity in Asia will continue to drive strong demand. And whilst the near-term outlook is, is, uh, is, is difficult to, to get too optimistic about uh, for the reasons I've set out before, mainly in Asia, the medium-term outlook is still pretty good. So, um, Michael, that, that's really uh, uh, all I have to say. I mean, this, the last slide is a, is a summary uh, slide, um, but happy to, to take a few questions if there are any.